Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace be with you all. Today, as you see, we're in chapter 5 of the story. And if you're reading along each week, thank you. And if not, I hope that you will do so starting this coming week and read six, chapter 6 before next week. We have a few copies of the story out where you'll get your coffee after worship. Since starting the story with the account of creation and that time in the Garden of Eden, it's been quite a ride for God, who's been trying to get into this stable, satisfying relationship with people. And so far, God's success rate is pretty low. Five weeks ago, as we started, I said that throughout the next eight months of using the story in worship, we'll be keeping an eye fixed on the prevailing goal God is in this relentless pursuit of a relationship with people. Thus far in the story, that pursuit has involved several surprising turns and great disappointment for God, all caused by people. But we've already learned something very important about God. We've learned that God has this amazing ability to change, to devise new plans and new ways and hopes of achieving that relationship with people. And one of those new plans is the focus of chapter five today. So for the sake of review and introduction, if you're joining the story for the first time, we're looking at the Bible using two lenses. One lens helps us see that upper story, which tells us God's story. It helps us see the big picture. In the upper story, we discover so much about God and God's character and God's desires. We see what God is up to. And the other lens is the lower story. This is our story. The lower story tells us about human life, about our dreams and dramas, about how people deal with conflict, how they disobey God, how they forget about God in the midst of daily life. While this lower story is our story, God does show up with that relentless pursuit of a relationship. So, as we get to chapter 5, these Israelites have been on the move. They've been freed from slavery in Egypt. They've passed through that Red Sea while watching the pursuit of their slave masters get swallowed up behind them. And now they're on the Sinai Peninsula, and these people have come to the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai in this case. And at this point, God has a new vision for leading these people through Moses. God has a plan to lead them to the Promised Land, but this plan also involves a new deal. So here in chapter 5, it appears that when God is handling people, God has gotten smarter. Now, don't take that as an affront to the God of heaven and earth, but let's be honest about this. So far in this story, God has been saddened, God has been frustrated, God has been confounded, and made hopping mad by the antics and the atrocities of people. So God has a new deal that we learn of here in chapter 5, and it has two parts. One part is those Ten Commandments. The other part involves God coming to be present directly with the people. And as you read at the end of chapter 5, you'll learn more about how God's presence resides with them through that tabernacle and then the presence of that Ark of the Covenant, that new deal that unfolds on Mount Sinai. Well, five years ago, I hiked up this mountain it was 3 a.m. when the alarm rang to rouse my friend and I to get dressed and lace up our walking shoes. Grabbing a water bottle and a cap, I made my way with a group of bleary-eyed pilgrims to the backside of St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of Mount Sinai. The air was cool, and I wondered if I had dressed warm enough. Well, not long into the trek, a group of men leading camels appeared. Mount Sinai is, is 7,500 feet high, and for some, these camels would ferry them as close to the top of the mountain as the animals were permitted. For those of us going all the way on foot, we'd get to the top just in time to see the sunrise. About an hour into this hike, switchbacking on these rocky paths, the air was getting thinner and not any warmer, and my fellow hikers were quiet. In these conditions, even the most extroverted person doesn't want to do any chitter chat. So as we hiked back and forth past these dimly lit concession stands, I hear the occupants inside shout out, Kit Kat, Baby Ruth, Coca-Cola. In the desert, the people of God were offered manna from heaven and cool water from a rock. 
on this early April morning, we were offered highly processed sugar and caffeine. Arriving at the top, there was a wind that had a bite that chilled me, so almost to a January in Wisconsin degree. I made my way to an outcropping that offered some protection from that wind and some distance from that crowd, and there I found myself warmed by wondering, what was it like to be Moses meeting God up in this thin air? However, did Moses hike up this mountain seven different times? I knew before I ever arrived at the top that this was going to be a one-time hike for me. Did God really expect this new deal of a covenant with ten commands to work with that increasingly defiant group of people? Well, on the hike down later that day after the air had warmed some, and my friends, some of who were pastors, were ready to talk about the experience, we discussed the wisdom of the covenant. There are two types of covenant in the Old Testament. There's divine covenant and there's mutual covenant. In a divine covenant, God does all the work. God says, this is what I'll do for you and through you. And when we met Abraham three weeks ago, God made a divine covenant with him with these words, I will give you a son, and I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. Remember that one? Divine covenants are based on a promise from God. The other type of covenant is a mutual covenant. In this one, both parties have work to do. The aim is a relationship, liken it to a marriage vow where both parties contribute to the success of the relationship. So here in chapter 5, God initiates a mutual covenant in the Ten Commandments. And God starts by saying three important things. Number one, I'm the Lord your God. Number two, this is what I've done for you in the past. And three, this is how I want you to respond to my grace and goodness. So understanding divine and mutual covenants will be helpful for us as we continue in the story. So in this mutual covenant today that God hands Moses up there on the Mount Sinai, we get this back and forth. Because I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery in Egypt, therefore you shall have no other gods before me. Because I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery in Egypt, therefore you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Because I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery in Egypt, therefore you shall honor your father and mother. Therefore you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery. Therefore you shall not steal. And you get it. This because, therefore, language of these commandments is the foundation of how we understand the scriptures. God's loving action always comes before God's expectations of us. God tells us what God does and has done for us before God ever asks us to do anything. These Ten Commandments have been misunderstood and misused for centuries, and the debate in the American public arena has not been helpful in reminding anyone as to why God gave these commandments to Moses up on that mountain in the first place. God gives these commandments to newly freed people who have no idea how to live together in freedom. For so long they've lived under those Egyptian slave masters who made all the rules. They commanded, they told the people how long they would work, they told them how many bricks to make, they told them when to sleep, they told them when to eat. But now, out of slavery in Egypt, God's concerned about how these people are going to order their lives. How would they live together in healthy ways? So God's new deal, it comes out of that concern, these commandments. That was God's new deal for these people on Mount Sinai. Now, maybe it seems strange to you that God uses commands or laws or rules to initiate a new deal, but knowing that the upper story is about God's pursuit of a relationship with people, a mutual covenant is a wise way to go. Well, we still have 17 chapters in the story before we reach the New Testament, 
and meet Jesus. Up until that, up to that point, the chapters that we're going to be dealing with will find God getting frustrated, even angry, again and again with these people who can't seem to do their part in the covenant. Finally, we'll see God realizing that this pursuit of this relationship with, with people still isn't working. So God will make another plan. And this time, God will use the divine covenant. And this covenant comes with the name Jesus. One day, Jesus is asked about the commandments. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the earlier ones. There, my friends, is the upper story. A divine covenant from God for you. Amen.